The Macrig Heresy. A young boy shuffled nervously into a large, circular room. A well-clothed servitor stood on either side of the door silent as death and just as cold. Its one wall filled near to bursting with books. Old and new, dusty and worn, they crowded every shelf from the floor to the very ceiling, a full three stories above the boy's head. He walked, even slower than before, into the center of the room, his head on a swivel, taking in everything at once. On each level above the first there was a cast iron terrace that wound around the whole room. The second story was noticeably larger than the third, giving the room a strange, funneled look. The first floor sported a pair of wheeled ladders connected to its wall, and he could make out at least one more on the second. Another well-dressed servitor stood blankly at attention next to the base of each ladder. The boy couldn't make out any details of the third floor even with his head tilted back till his neck began to ache. Large, comfortable chairs were placed at irregular intervals around the room, each flanked by a large, ornamental lamp. The ironwork columns were lavishly decorated with eagles and fleurs de lis. At the highest point of each level, just below the next level's floor, were four snarling faces. They were rather abstract, as they were fashioned from bent iron bars, but he could just make out that they were meant to be bulldog heads. One head on each column pointed inwards, with another to both the left and right, with a fourth pointing outwards towards the wall. Equally lavish lanterns were gripped by the handle in each snarling maw. A spiral staircase wound its way upwards directly across from the door. Most impressive of all was the beautiful ceiling. Fashioned by master artisans out of stained glass, the room's domed ceiling depicted the emperor of mankind in all of his glory staring downward. Hovering around his benevolent features were dozens of smaller figures, saints, cherubs, winged skulls, and complex roses of red and white. An intricate network of fluorescent lights illuminated the image from behind. The boy's mouth began to drop open. Enough gawking boy, get up here already. The gruff, sandpaper voice caught him by surprise and he quickly stiffened and slapped his mouth shut with an audible snap. Second floor, boy. To the left. He gulped nervously and made his way to and up the staircase. As he ascended, he noticed a small track inlaid between the handle and the railing. At the base of the second level, its purpose became clear. A motorized chair was attached to it. Quickly now, rasped the voice. He picked up his pace, his feet clanking noisily on the iron floor. Around the bend, hunched before a ladder and straining to look up at the servitor at its zenith, was the oldest man the young boy had ever seen. He wore a fine robe of black wool, with red silk on the inverse side. Slippers of almost comically large size were on his feet. His tiny left arm was drawn behind his back in the military style, whilst the other held a large ivory pipe with a long wooden neck in his shriveled lips. A few vapors of smoke rose lazily from the head. The side of his face was an almost indiscernible patchwork of wrinkles, old scars, and metallic implants. Though not a hair made its presence known on his bald scalp, a bushy grey moustache engulfed his upper lip and threatened to drown the little peak that was his cauliflower nose. A small matte green canister hung from the hovering skull to the man's left. From it, two thin tubes snaked their way down and up again into the open front of the man's robe. Gee great great grandfather, sir the boy began. Just a second. He croaked with a puff of smoke. He was still looking up at the servitor on the ladder. The boy followed his gaze. This servitor, like all luxury models used as servants, was still mostly human-like in appearance, only the bulky metal box growing from the back of its head and the padded claw that replaced its right arm. As the pair watched, the figure ceased its visual scan of the books and delicately extracted a large, leather-bound tome with its metal hand. Then it slowly made its way back down the ladder, its joints humming and boots clanking on the metal. As it reached the floor the old man shuffled out of the way. It made a loud thump as it landed and it quickly turned and offered the book to its master. After an awkward silence the man turned his head towards his young descendant and regarded him for the first time. His face was just about unreadable, but the boy thought he could make out a scowl hidden in the man's labyrinthine face. He withered under the scrutiny and suppressed the urge to shuffle. Aren't you going to carry that big, heavy book for your old man's old man's old man the ancient wheezed? The youth fairly jumped forward and grabbed the tome with due haste. Yes sir, he spouted just as quick. Good, the man croaked. 
And you can stop with that sir and great great nonsense. Another puff of smoke. It makes me feel as old as I am. This was followed by more croaking. Somewhere between a laugh and a cough. Grandpa, or granddad, or grandfather, or just general, will do fine. He shuffled his way to the stairs with the boy in tow while the servitor took up its customary place next to the ladder and stood at attention once more like all of its peers. The motorized chair at the stairwell unfolded automatically as its owner neared. He, in turn, slumped into the seat and fastened the belt around his waist. With the barked command, down, the little chair hummed its way to the ground floor. Once he reached the bottom he unfastened his harness and hopped down. Then he made his way to a pair of recliners separated by a small desk and fell into one with an audible sigh of comfort. The boy, following in his wake, stood nervously a beater away from his elder. As if noticing him for the fifth time, the old man looked up. Oh, yes. Place that here and make yourself comfortable, he said. He watched as the boy carefully placed the book on the desk and climbed into the much too large seat. Once the boy stopped moving he nodded in approval and spoke again. I have some tea on the way, it should arrive the library's double doors silently swooshed open and a servant, a real human this time, glided in with a silver dolly. Nowish, the old man finished with what the boy believed was a smile. The servant placed a large tray on the desk. In the center was a large china teapot decorated plainly, but tastefully, with a few red and white lines that curled their way around its midsection. A pair of matching cups on tiny saucers were placed on either flank, around which lay a few plates of hot, thinly sliced cakes and biscuits. His task completed, the servant stood at attention just behind the desk. Thank you, France, nodded the seated elder. France made a formal bow and made his way towards the door, sidestepping the servitor that marched from its place to the right side of the door to take his place. The partially mechanical man then lifted the pot and began pouring out two precisely measured cups of steaming tea. Good old Earl Grey, swooned the old man as he took his cup, one of the oldest known teas. From all the way back to the days before the Emperor's ascension on Terra, he took a deep breath of the vapors. I happened to have ordered the leaves for this pot straight from the blessed cradle herself. The youth nearly dropped his cup at that last remark. His elder shot him a nasty look. A scowl for certain this time. He mumbled an apology as he thought about the implications of wealth and power that would require. Just be careful, the old man said as he took a tentative sip from his cup. This china is almost 600 years old. At this the boy just stared, wide-eyed, at his senior. Seeing his look the old man chuckled. Have to save the good stuff for special occasions, don't you know? He smiled and took another sip. So, he began. Your father's second tour is up and he's brought his family back to his home world. This was a statement, not a question. Yes 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 grandfather. Father served on the Delphi for 40 years. 15 as her captain. He is a good boy. I was a tad bit disappointed that he didn't serve in the guard like his father and me. But I supposed enough of your uncles did that. Now didn't they he shuffled into a more comfortable position. Yes. All in all, I have to say I'm proud of him for branching off and doing something different. Took courage, that, they both sat in silence for a moment. What was his name again and yours too? For that matter, the boy coughed awkwardly to clear his throat. Adolphus, grandfather. Adolphus Fark of Old Zerbrak. And I am Gustavus Farch Fark of Old Zerbrak. Yes I remember now. One of Krell's boys. You must forgive my poor memory. He thought to himself for a moment. You'd be nine. Now, right Gusto smiled as he answered. Yes, grandfather, nine tear and standard just three weeks ago. See, it's all coming back to me. I just need a kick start sometimes. How was the trip from the Otwood sector quite fine, actually? I've been through much worse. The trip was only 180 days. Transition to transition. The young Zerbrak answered after a sip of tea, which he noted was quite delicious. Right, you'd have been born in void, yes, ever been planet side before only twice, for victory parades on Ganthax and Ords, and never for this long. The elderly man nodded and took a puff from his pipe. How do you find Rolt's world beautiful? He answered truthfully. These mountains are breathtaking, quite eloquent, for a young man, aren't you the old man chuckled? 
He was silent for a moment. I feel like testing my memory some more. Would you mind humoring an old crusader for a while, and listen to a story I'd love to? Beamed Gustav. Hear a story, that it, grandfather, he added hastily. After laughing for a moment the wizened general began. Good, boy. Good boy, he took another sip of tea. Now where should I begin he tapped his pipe on his chin a few times, I know a good one, the Macrug heresy. How does that sound wonderful, grandfather, truth be told, he had heard the basics before in history class, but his grandfather had asked him to humor him, did he not? This was all many hundreds of years ago, you understand, back in the waning days of the 41st millennium. It all started at the second scouring of Kroxga, in the Ultima Segmentum. After the local populace repelled a fairly large invasion from the Orcs of Caridon while the reinforcements from the Imperium were still en route, they got it in their heads that they didn't need the Emperor's help anymore. So, after the fleet arrived some months later and began to resupply, as was their Emperor given right, the Croxbirds announced that they were seceding from the Empire and attacked, they hit pretty damned hard, too. Considering they had just survived an orc wide nearest we can estimate, they took out a fourth of the fleet's warships and over a third of the ground troops. Obviously, this didn't sit well with the Imperials, and they quickly launched an all-out attack. In those first few weeks thousands of ground troops and fleet personnel died as we knocked out their orbital defenses and began landing our troops. Finally, we did manage to exert air superiority, well, in space at least. On the ground. However, things were very different. You see, Kroxka had seen a lot of war in its lifetime. They got invaded by orcs or elder around every century or so, so they knew how to fight. Most of their cities were buried in the mountains or under their oceans, with underground bases scattered all over the planet. Everywhere our boys landed they got hit hard, but couldn't find anyone to shoot back at half the time. By the time General Davis, the commanding officer, realized he had lost half of his remaining troops, he was getting quite worried. He quickly sent out a request for reinforcements from the guard and any space marines that might be in the area, and lo and behold, the ultramarines show up three weeks later. Now, I don't know how much you know about the ultramarines, but there are some things you have to understand. They were one of the first 20 legions, and their founder, the Primarch Robert Gilliman, just about saved the Imperium after the Horus Heresy. He literally wrote the book on space marines, and although his Codex Astartes isn't widely used anymore, it was regarded with almost religious reverence and followed to the letter by almost every chapter in the galaxy, at the time. The thing is, this went to the Ultramarines' heads. They believed that they were better than every other space marine chapter in every way, and believed that marines were better than everyone else in every way. They were pompous and arrogant as hell, but about two thirds of the 1000 or so space marine chapters that existed at the time were descended from their stock, so the higher lords had no choice but to let them have their way. Anyway, it wasn't just any ultramarine army that showed up at Kroxga, it was two full companies led by Marnius Kalga himself. Kalga, you see, was their chapter master at the time, and even people that didn't like his chapter had to admit that he was a damned good warrior and leader of men. Thing is, for an ultramarine, he was pretty humble. In fact, he only requested that he be given overall command of the campaign, rather than demanding it. After some deliberation, Davis and his staff decided that they couldn't risk losing the support of over 200 space marines by refusing, so they gave him command. Truth be told, Kalga lived up to his reputation. He led from the front and didn't waste the lives of the guardsmen under his command. This is significant as many marine commanders think of us mere mortals as cannon fodder. He directed the guard with all due competence and had his marines strike where the enemy was presumed to be weakest. It all fell apart at the Hill 53 incident, however. Intelligence indicated that a major command sent lay under that hill and Kalga led the combined marine guard assault himself. That's where things get sketchy. We know now that L-53 wasn't nearly as important a base as they had thought at the time. We believe that the rebels moved everything important to a base they built while the original fleet was still inbound, one that obviously wouldn't have been on any imperial records. We also know now that the rebels had the area heavily and pre-sighted with heavy ordnance. 
What we don't know, is how Kalgu was separated from his honor guard and came to be in direct command of an IG platoon. It is believed that his unit suffered a direct hit from a massive enemy bombardment, which we base on the fact that none of his honor guard were reported to have survived the battle. It was shortly thereafter that the shot that was heard across the galaxy was fired, and Manius Kalga was summarily executed by the platoon's commissar. According to the official report, Kalga ordered the surviving members of the platoon to fall back. Commissar Renyard voiced his opposition to the order. Kalga repeated his order, stating that the attack had failed and that they needed to regroup to plan the next assault. Renyard then fired a single round from his bolt pistol into the ultramarine commander's unhelmeted face, Lieutenant Haggard, the platoon's senior officer, would later testify that he just stood there and took it in the face. I don't think he believed what he was seeing, a commissar turning his weapon on him. Afterwards, Renyard ordered the platoon forward. They managed to find a hole in the side of the hill, presumably caused by a stray round fired by the enemy. By using every grenade, demolition charge, and melter bomb they had, the platoon blasted their way into the Hill 53 base. After 47 minutes of fighting, only 34 of the original 75 members of the platoon, including a wounded Commissar Rayard and Lieutenant Haggard, survived. They had captured the complex, 56 prisoners including a colonel and 8 other officers, and valuable maps of the enemy's underground network. 22 days later, the high command of the Kroxka Successionist Armed Forces surrendered to the Imperium. The surviving Ultramarines would not learn of the events surrounding their commander's death for another six days. However, when they did discover how their chapter master met his inglorious end, they immediately demanded the life of Commissar Rayard, whom had been quickly shuttled off planets to a ship leaving the system. For 77 days the Ultramarines pursued the Carthago Nova. The ship the Commissar has hitched a ride in, all the way to Perfectus Primus, capital of the Perfectus Sector and the staging ground for most fleet and big operations in that area. They arrived two days after the Nova, and once again demanded that Commissar Renyard be handed over to them. Renyard, having just been exonerated by a Commissariat Tribunal on the ground that the battle situation not hopeless as the Ultramarine Master had asserted as proven by the platoon's heroic success. As such, Governor Sedris of the Prefectus Sector, at the urgings of the Imperial Guard and Commissariat, refused to comply with the Ultramarines' demands. Exactly one hour later, a Terminator Strike Force under the command of Chapter Master Elect Ajaman teleported into the Adeptus Munitorum Central Office on Prefectus Primus, killed 682 adepts, guardsmen, and visitors, and burned Commissar Renyard to death with a heavy flamer. After teleporting back to the battle barge Octavius, they destroyed 112 vessels in orbit, including the Star Fortress Emperor's Shield, the defense ship sent to detain the Octavius, and numerous civilian vessels. Between the deaths at the central office, in orbit, and from the stray round fired by the Ultramarines that hit Jacobi Hive, it is estimated that at least 3 million adepts, soldiers, sailors, and civilians were killed. The event has gone down in history as the Prefectus Massacre. The Ultramarines were declared excommunicate traitorous by the Inquisition, and the Macrig heresy began. A total of 66 Space Marine chapters, all of which were descendants of the Ultramarine Genocide, sided with the now rogue chapter. The Gilliman Alliance, as the traitors called themselves, massed an estimated 52,000 Space Marines at Macrig, their headquarters under the command of Warmaster Agarman. It is believed that Agarman, the first company captain and rightful successor of Kalgara's chapter master, was challenged for the position by the second company captain, Cato Sicarius. To avoid infighting that would have crippled their initiative, the council of chapter masters, made up of the 60 chapter masters present at Macrag, decided to give Sicarius the title of chapter master, but gave the loftier title of Warmaster to Agarman which appeased them both. Declaring the noble Imperium corrupt, the Alliance launched the Gilliman Crusade, an all-out assault towards Terra and the Segmentum Solar to take control of the Imperium. They left nothing but destruction in their wake. Believing that any one planet that did not subject itself to the Alliance's rule was a traitor to Gilliman and the Emperor, in that order, I might add, they raised every world they resupplied it in between Macrig and the Segmentum Solar. 
they were particularly harsh on space marine chapters that did not join their cause, and 13 chapters were wiped out to the man, and their genesee destroyed, by the vengeful ultramarines and their allies. These chapters are now known as the 13 Martyrs, and 13 Shrine Worlds were commissioned afterwards to commemorate and honor their sacrifice in slowing their traitorous once brothers. It should be noted that 8 of those chapters were descendants of the Ultramarines. By the time the Alliance reached the outskirts of the Segmentum Solar, Marines from nearly 100 chapters flew with them. However, a massive fleet had been raised to stop them. 435,000 Space Marines from a confirmed 518 chapters, and well over 6 million sailors of the Imperial Navy met and crushed the Alliance fleet at the Battle of Gibraltar. Amongst the chapters present in the fleet were marines from all eight of the first foundings still loyal to the Imperium. It was decided that Commander Dante of the Blood Angels would be given command of the fleet, while the Space Wolves Lord Grimner was given overall command any and all ground operations. The Battle of Gibraltar was bloody indeed, with many casualties on both sides. At the time, it was believed that both Agamemnon and Sicarius, the Arc Traitors of the Alliance, were killed along with 33,000 of their followers, their numbers having been boosted by recruits along the way. We learned much later that Sicarius fled to the Eye of Terror with nearly 2,000 marines in tow. There he slew Abaddon the Despoiler and took command of his Black Legion and all of his allies. But that is another story. Fleeing in every direction, around 72 chapters begged for and were eventually granted pardons by the Higher Lords of Terror. Roughly 19,000 marines still loyal to the Ultramarines cause fled back to Ultramar. Once the Imperial Fleet Retribution caught up with them, less than 9,000 still stood to defend their Primarch's old empire. It is believed that in fighting did indeed tear apart their traitorous alliance in the end. Each surviving captain of the Ultramarines believed himself to be the ideal successor of the title War Master, while 15 captains and chapter masters from other chapters believed the same, declaring that Dead Agamemnon had proven that the Ultramarines were not fit to lead the Alliance. In the end, they never did decide on a new leader. They were still bickering and arguing amongst themselves, violently in fact, when the Loyalists fell upon them. The host, Led by Commander Dante and Great Wolf Logan Grimner lead their marines in a bloodless battle of absolute slaughter. Only 102 loyalist marines were felled during that, the Battle of Ultramar. The traitors were hit with such ferocity and righteous zeal that they were dead to the man before any of the fleet's guardsmen even made planet fall. It would be another two and a half centuries before the heresy officially ended with the exterminatus of the Sons of Aura's homeworld of Armato. They were the last of the 17 chapters that remained unrepentant or unsalvageable by the High Lords. The Imperium has changed much since so days. The High Lords passed sweeping legislation allowing any chapter that fought for the Imperium against the Ultramarines and their allies to completely abandon the Codex Astartes if they so chose. Those chapters were also invited to found new chapters and to greatly expand their numbers. Of remaining first. Each founded at least four new chapters, with the exception of the Space Wolves, who only founded one new chapter, the Catachan Devils. The Blood Angels alone founded seven new chapters within 50 years, and now number nearly 10,000. However, every chapter, especially those that did not take part in the war, were required to reaffirm their fealty to the Emperor and his Imperium. For the first time in recorded history, an envoy from every loyal chapter stood before the Emperor himself and swore, in the name of their respected chapter, to serve him and his higher lords as his proxy for the rest of eternity. As part of their oath, every chapter is required to maintain a garrison of at least 100 marines at terror at all times. A new chapter was formed with similar organization to the Death Watch, called the Praetorian Guard which is tasked with supplementing the Adeptus Custodes should they need it, and to persecute the Imperium's wars against traitor chapters. In this way, the Astartes polices itself, albeit at the command of the Imperium. He sat smoking silently for a while as he let it all sink in. Do you know what the moral of that story is Gustav raked his brain for the answer. After several moments he ventured. The actions of one man can change the galaxy no, it's, don't piss off a commissar.